a temporary restriction on non-essential travel to the European Union. Are we are in a situation Why of that? War. Because we think non-essential travel is going to see a dramatic rise in the number of deaths. The, enemies there. It, the sheer the numbers of people succumbing to, to the coronavirus Three. is overwhelming every hospital in northern Italy. We're at war. In a true sense, we're at war. And we're fighting an invisible enemy. Think of that. Alpha Day Church, Pastor Kevin here, coming to you by way of video again. These times remind me of one of my favorite quotes in a movie. It comes out of Lord of the Rings, where uh, the question is kind of presented, why are these things happening? And I wish they hadn't. Take a look. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. Bilbo was meant to find the ring, in which case you also were meant to have it. And that is an encouraging thought. I love the Lord of the Rings. I love that scene. You just uh, capture Frodo sitting there and he's stressed out. He knows he's going to have to walk through enemy territory under a lot of stress, with a lot of hardship. And there's this voice of wisdom coming from the side there, right? That there are other forces at work besides evil. And I imagine that some people in our church have, a, have the same kind of thought. You may not know this, but... Uh, in the last week, I've heard from people. Uh, they're going to lose their job. Some people are being, being furloughed, temporary. Uh, loss of job, loss of work, loss of pay. Some people are being quarantined. Some people are being tested. Perhaps they have the virus. In, in my house, my nine-year-old daughter, this is like a vacation. Um, to her, the way she sees all this is all the family is around, and, we're, and we're, she's able to see her brother who just came back from Seattle, and uh, it's, it, there's a fun element to it. But yet, for many of us, the, uh, there's a harder road. And I think that uh, today, I want to address, um, in the same way that that voice of wisdom is speaking into Frodo there, what does the Bible say to those who, uh, it could be a hard road, and why? Well, I'm going to begin with this. I, I titled this, um, east of Eden, and, and the thought is this, that if you go back all the way to the beginning of the Bible, God creates the world, and there are none of these things. Every time he is creating uh, uh, plants and animals, and he's putting them into place, it's, it's good, it's good, it's good. And there's nothing that is bad. And what happens is, in that garden, it's good, but because sin comes into the world, and we get this in different parts of the Bible, but, but Paul says it in Romans 5.12, he says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all have sinned, that that's where death came into the world, because of sin. So, so they're moved out of the garden, Adam and Eve, and the curse is put upon them and they're going to have to till the ground and these kinds of things. You have the garden and then uh, sidestepping if it's kind of a, a timeline where you're moving from left to right or from west to east on the east side of that timeline of, uh, of the garden. That's where we are living right now. We're living in a, in a time where uh, the world is broken. God didn't make it that way, but the world, the, the, the world is broken. And that means that when we um, live through our lives, we're going to experience brokenness in some way. And I want to look at what Paul says about that. In Romans chapter 8, 22 to 23, he says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And if I back up actually one more verse, it says, 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And what we see in the first thing that I wanted to share, speaking into this, is that in a broken world, we're going to experience brokenness. And it's kind of like when we live in Guam, we're going to experience humidity because that's what is it's like here in Guam. You can live inside of a house with air conditioning, but eventually you're going to go outside and you're going to experience humidity. And we live in a broken world. We will experience uh, the aspects of that brokenness, whether we see it in relationships, whether we see it in how we view money or what we do with power or the places of importance in our life that, that, that pleasures are. Uh, these things are going to all be stained and affected by sin. And we see that Paul says, notice the two, two things I pulled out of there are the phrase subjected to a futility, creation is, and that creation is in bondage to decay. And that's because of the problem of sin. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 24 describes this brokenness pretty good. It says the earth is defiled. It literally says the earth that, that is underneath the people who are walking on it it is defiled. It is utterly broken because, and it says, they have broken God's laws. They have sinned. That sin comes in and affects our world. Paul uh, uses also this word groaning. If he caught that as we were going through the passage, um, creation is groaning as if there's something painful. We were not made to live in a world like this stained by sin. God didn't make it this way. And there's an aspect that it rubs up against us in that way. And there's a groaning in creation itself, but also in us, because he goes on to say that we are groaning. Both creation and we who uh, are believers in Christ are groaning. Um, he also uses the analogy of childbirth. He uses this phrase like birth pangs. And when a woman is going to give birth to a baby, uh, she goes through uh, birth pangs, and they're like a signal that, that, that the baby is coming. And there is a, a sense where, in Scripture, what we see is when the, the birth pangs are happening, sometimes these big events, sometimes um, just the um, uh, grittiness and the futility and the, and, the, and the decay and the bondage, the brokenness of life, these are like birth pangs that are pointing us to something that is coming. And that thing that is coming is something that will remove uh, those aspects of this world. And they are a reminder, a constant reminder to us that we're not made for a world that is broken, even though we're living in that now. Um, in 2004, uh, there was a tsunami. Um, an earthquake happened off in the Indian Ocean, and a, and a, a tsunami came and hit Thailand, $15 billion worth of damage and over 200,000 lives were lost. And the interesting thing is that uh, all kinds of people it, were lost. Not just one ethnicity or one uh, rich or poor or, or Christian and non-Christian. In fact, whole churches were lost. And yet, we know that God can command the waves. We see that uh, uh, in the New Testament, um, he is in the, in the midst of the storm with his disciples, and he says, be still. And the wind and the waves, they listen and obey to him. And the disciples are in awe of that. They say, who is this that even, essentially, Mother Nature listens to him? If he can stop that wave, why did he allow it? Why did he allow it to crash in $15 billion worth of damage, 200,000 plus lives lost? So, that's what I'm driving at here. We live in a broken world, but how do we understand the way in which it works? Is it just blind luck? Is it just, well, you know, we're going to navigate life and some of us will get hit by the wave, some of us will be saved, and it's just some are lucky and some are not. But just like that voice of, of wisdom that came into Frodo and said there are other forces at work that are not evil. There are other forces that aren't just tied to the, the brokenness of life and the, and the decay and, and the bondage to that decay. We're going to see that, that God has a purpose to things. And there's something foundational that if we believe God is good, if we believe that he loves us, 
then when something happens that, like a, like a wave, like a pandemic, then it, then it tests us to, to, to trust in him, that he does have a purpose. And the second point is just that we must trust that God has a purpose when he allows brokenness. So in verse 28, um, many of us know this uh, verse, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. In the same passage as he's talking about the brokenness of the world and the birth pangs and the decay, he says all things work together for those for good for those who are his, who are called uh, to his purposes. And I wanted to say to you that uh, besides futility, besides the, the natural brokenness of the world, that God is working. And there's different ways that he works in brokenness. And I was going to just share with you four examples of that. Um, off the top of the head of my head as I was thinking about uh, this passage and what to say, I mean, the plagues of Egypt. I mean, God brought the plagues of Egypt to, for a purpose because he was trying to move a political leader. He was trying to move a political leader to free his people. We could see him sometimes use things like plagues on a large scale like that. In, in uh, Acts chapter 12, we see uh, King Herod gives a great speech to the people, and, and, and the response that comes out of those people is that he is God, and he accepts that title. He doesn't rebuff them. And in that moment, God takes his life. God judges him for the arrogant pride that he has. It says he falls over dead, and his body was eaten by worms. Sometimes we see God judge well, in that case, a political leader, but uh, a person for their sin. But we can't say that all bad things that happen are directly tied to a sin like Herod there because in John chapter 9, there's a blind man that Jesus comes across. And the leaders there say, uh, tell us, uh, why, why is he blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? His blindness must be attached to some kind of sin. And Jesus says it's not because of sin. If you read that in John chapter 9, he says it's because in this moment God wanted to show his glory through what Christ was going to do. And he picks up some mud and he spits in it and he rubs the man's eyes and he heals him. And there's a case where how was God using the brokenness of that man? He was teaching something through the moment that God has power over that brokenness. And God's glorified in that. Another way that God uses brokenness uh, in this world is to purify and to save his own people. And we can learn uh, from Paul's teaching on communion. I want to read to you that passage because uh, something's going on when we approach the communion table. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27, it says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why, now listen to this, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. The first Sunday of every month, our church has communion. That passage I just read mentioned some of you are weak, some of you are ill, some of you have been called home to heaven. And just before those verses, Paul was giving instructions for how to approach the Lord's table. God didn't want the believers to come to the table while they still had sin in uh, their lives or their hearts, and he wanted them to deal with that first. And so... What we see in the passage is those who were not doing that correctly, Paul is saying that's the reason why you're weak. That's the reason why you've been ill. And some of you have even been called home to be with the Lord. And the best part of it, though, is at the very end of that section, he says that that's discipline, but the discipline is, has a saving purpose. And that purpose is, as he states, is so that we will not be condemned like the world. And that's a great thing for us, that God works in a way that might be scary to us, 
but it does have a saving purpose. I think it's both an amazing and sobering thing that God would discipline his children for those very reasons. Through sickness, through uh, uh, weakness, uh, and even death, to cut off a trajectory uh, in a person's life that could lead to, lead to condemnation. And I, I've just shown you four different ways that God uses brokenness in the world. And that kind of leads us to that if he has a purpose behind it, then we should trust in what he is doing. And there's a variety of ways that he can work, even now through this pandemic that's going on. And that is why Paul says in Romans 8, 28, that he works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And that leads me to the last point, which is that God allows brokenness to reorient us to the only true hope. And he says um, in verse 24, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And there's some nudging there to be patient for what God is bringing. Just like the birth pangs say there's something that's coming, uh, that we need to know that uh, while we are in the brokenness moments, to be patient and to be hoping for something that we don't see right now, something that's down the road. We live east of Eden, but we live west of eternal glory with Christ. That is what lies ahead. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, and we had massive thunderstorms. I, I can still remember as a kid, you could be in your house, and this loud, booming thunder would shake the whole house. You know what that is? It would alert us. It would wake us up. It would cause us to walk over to the window and look up to the sky to see what was going on. And there's a way in which uh, something like a, a pandemic, a global pandemic like this, can be uh, like a thunder to the world, to wake us up, to cause us to look up. Uh, one of my favorite preachers is John Piper. He says that all disasters are a thunderclap of divine mercy in the midst of judgment, calling all people to repent and realign their lives by grace with the infinite worth of the glory of God. And there's a way in which I just want to say that this could be a thunderclap for you. Are you, are you missing it? Are you missing the moment? Um, has our hope been in things we just can see? Or is our true hope lying west of glory, ahead of us, something that's coming in our life? Now, um, that brings me to, I like to always finish with some applicational points to us. And I give them to you really quick. Because what does this mean for us? What does this mean for uh, a church living in Guam and the things that are going on? Uh, I mentioned earlier that um, some in our church are being quarantined. Some uh, are being tested for the virus. Some are losing their jobs. So what does it mean to our body? And last week uh, we gave some practical things and I want to build on top of those. And here they are. The first is uh, I want to say to us, let us continue to meet together. I love how uh, in the New Testament, it often uses that phrase, phrase let us. Uh, and that's why sometimes Christians say, are, are you eating your salad? But um, let us continue to meet together. And you say, well, we can't. But even when the church was dispersed in the book of Acts, where they were broken up and persecution was going on, in history, when uh, the church was, was not able to congregate corporately on a Sunday, they still met in smaller groups, sometimes in secret. And the way in which we might have to keep it up now is through social media means. Um, you're going to be hearing more about Zoom. Uh, I met with all our small group meters, uh, leaders uh, through uh, a Zoom app. Uh, if you don't know about it, look it up or ask uh, someone in our church about it. Um, if you're not in a small group, then uh, contact our office. We'll, we'll try to put you in a, a group where you can at least participate. But uh, I met with all our small group meters. We were able to talk, all of us on the screen. It was great. Uh, perhaps you chimed into the Facebook live stream. That's another way that you can connect to our church. And I learned things about our church through the Facebook live stream. There was over 300 people that have viewed that now, um, maybe close to 350 at this point. But um, I, I learned about things to pray about. I learned about some of the struggles that some of our, our people are going through. So connect in, continue to meet together in these ways and continue to pray, 
continue to pray for uh, our church. If you uh, are finding out that some of our members are, are being quarantined or losing jobs or being tested, we should be praying for those members. Um, so being connected helps us be able to pray together better. And I wanted to say to us to not be judgmental of one another. <clears throat> Every day uh, about <clears throat> sunset, people just show up on this campus and they start running and jogging, I think because uh, of the ban on the parks and stuff. But it's put us in this position where my, my, even my, my wife and I, we have these discussions. You know, should we go out there and tell them and, uh, uh, to go away? Uh, there's a way in which we can look at how some people are responding to uh, <clears throat> the executive order or restrictions and they're responding differently. And some things we're given are very clear. Some things uh, are, are less clear. We should be good on the ones that are clear, but, but, but some of the restrictions, if they're not that clear, Christians might respond differently because the Bible addresses this. It, it says that sometimes there's going to be a matter of the conscience. Uh, Paul in uh, Corinthians uh, talks about uh, eating food and which days we, we consider holy. And, and he, he says this, do we not have the right to eat and drink? And he talks about our rights because uh, for some people, we, we might have the right, but our, our conscience bothers us, so we withdraw from it. And I want us to be thinking that way. <clears throat> if you see a picture and somebody is gathered together and you think they shouldn't be doing that, uh, we need to have grace towards one another. Um, when Ethan came back from Seattle, a lot of people wanted to come visit with him. And there was a point, so he signed a piece of paper saying that he would quarantine himself in the house. And we kind of went through this uh, conversation, well, if we let that person, then this person, and that, and then pretty soon it was like, well, if we let that many, then is, is it, 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 by, by our conscience, are we, are we actually adhering to um, him quarantining? What is quarantine then? And we just decided that we were going to follow it the, the most strictest way possible. And for me, some of that had to do with that, because I'm a church uh, a leader that others might look at and follow. And um, I just want to err there uh, on, on the side of caution, but I just want to say to our church, we need to continue to meet together, we need to continue to pray for one another, and we need to be gracious with one another, maybe not be judging one another with how we might respond in different ways. Um, and then lastly, I just want to continue to exhort you to peace, um, to have a peace and to promote that peace. Uh, you know, I can see some people getting worked up uh, and they want to camp out on, is this the end times? Or they're trying to have conversations about, uh, if you uh, have no sin, the virus won't touch you. And, and um, um, this is God's judgment. And I, I want to have a balanced uh, approach. Uh, some of those conversations can be good. I, I don't agree with some of those points. But fundamentally, what I'm giving you today is that that God has a purpose behind what he does, and uh, we need to trust him, and that we need to uh, be fixing our eyes on what is ahead, on what our true hope is. And there we have um, Frodo all worried about the path that he's going to uh, take, and, and, and Gandalf says to him, uh, we can't control the times that come to us, right? But all we have to do is to decide how we're gonna gonna live in the time that is given to us? What are what are what are you gonna do in the next several weeks through this? How are you gonna use the time that is given to you? How will you respond? I want you to be encouraged. Even Christ, when when he was close to the end, said to his followers, "Let not your hearts be troubled." That we shouldn't live with with troubled hearts, but we should try to um, put into practice the things that we're talking about. And so um, let me just close this with a word of prayer, and I hope to see you perhaps out in social media circles and, and maybe in other ways. But Lord, we just thank you for being encouraged by your word, that you're a God who is in control. Even though we live in a broken world and we're going to experience brokenness, uh, we pray that uh, we might uh, trust that you have a purpose behind the things that happen. And in the ways that we can, that we would um, support one another through prayer, through uh, financial means through the giving of goods, sacrificing our own goods, as we talked about last week, but 
fundamentally reorienting ourselves when the thunderclap is heard that we would be fixing our eyes on Christ and his appearing in the clouds. As, as Revelation says, uh, in the end, he wins. He comes in the clouds in glory and to know that that is on um, the future side, that that's what we're heading towards. And let that be our focus. We lift this up in Christ's name. Amen. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. So do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world, Frodo, besides the will of evil. 